Um, can everyone see the slides? Um, yeah, good. Um, so I, I'll take a moment. Uh, most of you will know me. I'm a professor in the Department of Philosophy, and um, I'm a bit of an omnivore. So I do some. I've done some empirical work. I have interest in, in distributive justice, but also in uh, moral psychology, and especially in the reliability of our judgments in um, distributive justice. And uh, my co author on this project, who's also the lead author, is Veronica Luptakova. She uh, um, escaped a life uh, of, as a consultant, um, which made her, the, the last trace of that was that she thought that my draft slides looked extremely sloppy, um, but she didn't have enough time to beautify them because I was very slow in producing the content. So I apologize on her behalf for the sloppy slides. Um, and then she did an uh, executive MSc in behavioral science where they had one philosophy course. And um, I'm proud to say she was hooked. And uh, after, well, as, was it one or two years with the behavioral insights team in Britain? Um, she returned to and has just started a PhD this year on moral inconsistency or inconsistency in moral judgments. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to present work which was uh, from the core of her master's thesis in uh, behavioral science. And we're now working on uh, updating it and writing it up as a, a chapter in a book on um, advances in empirical political philosophy. So the question we're looking at is how do people balance death against lesser burdens, empirical evidence? I should also uh, say that my own research on this is supported by a grant from the Norwegian Development Agency called Decision Support for Universal Health Coverage. So this is our outline. Um, oh yeah, I, I told Veronica about the uh, the two ways which were, we can engage with uh, you unruly crowd. And she thought that it was extremely uncivilized to be interrupted in, uh, so we'll do the questions at the end, thank you. Uh, We'll start with some priority setting questions that indeed will give you shortened versions of two parts of a questionnaire that uh, Veronica did. And then we'll look at how the answers that are possible in, to these questions map on to different distributive theories and to uh, the practice of priority setting in health, in which I've also had uh, engaged with some of my research. And then we'll compare previous empirical research on two uh, issues which we're aiming to study. One is called equivalence refusals, and we'll define that for you later, but it's basically when you say, um, well, I'll, I'll keep it, uh, it'll be a surprise when it arrives. And the other is called off-scale refusals. Then we'll outline our study and our findings, and then finally some our conclusions. So here are some questions, and I will now also launch a um, poll. I'll read it out to you and then launch the poll. So you are advising a resource allocation manager in a government health service that serves 50 million people. So if for concreteness, if you wish, you're advising the NHS. In a series of pairwise choices, you must judge which treatment program should be covered. And you should assume throughout that the programs cost the same, that you cannot cover both, and you cannot split the funds, that the treatment that's covered leads to a full cure and that the uncovered treatment will not be available to anyone. Okay, so these are simply background assumptions. Now, the first, there's a series of questions. The first question is this, lives versus nails. I'll read it out and then I'll give you the poll. A director of a healthcare system can either choose a program that cures a nails disease. The nails disease basically is a fungal nail illness which causes nails to look unpleasant and crack and worst fall out, or a program that cures a fatal autoimmune disorder. First one we're calling nails and the other lives. If both programs could cure 100 people, what should the director choose? That question is now in front of you. 
Carol, give it 10 more seconds. All right, I'm now going to end polling and share the results. So the overwhelming majority of you might have seen this as a no brainer, saying if you can either cure 100 people of a nails disease, uh, which at worst might cause their nails to fall out, or uh, save 100 lives, you should do the latter. Then there's a follow up question. Be interesting to see who, the, who proposed curing 100 nails, but we'll, we might talk about that later in the chat. Um, I will now stop sharing results. So now suppose that you chose, you're in the vast majority who chose to save 100 lives over 100 nails. If the lives program continues to save 100 lives, how many people would program nails have to cure from the nails disease in order for you to be indifferent between choosing program nails and program lives? So now, the number of people you can save from the nails disease is variable. Is there a number for which you would be indifferent between choosing, saving that number from the nails disease and some other number from, uh, sorry, and 100 people's lives? And there's, for simplicity, just two answers possible. Somewhere between 100 and one and 50 million. There's some number in between that. That's the full population we're considering. Or there is no number large enough, or at least not in the population we're considering. Lives should always have priority. So I'll launch that poll. Give you 10 more seconds to vote. All right, very interesting. This one is evenly split. Share the results. Half of you say there is some number between uh, 101 and 50 million people that I could cure the Nils disease such that I'd be indifferent. And the other half say there's no number large enough lives should always have priority. Now, there's another question, lives versus paraplegias. Again, the setup is as follows, similar as before, a director of a healthcare system can either choose a program that cures, we described it as partial body paralysis and the details explain that it was a case of paraplegia, or a program that cures fatal, fatal autoimmune disorder. If both programs could cure 100 people, what should the director choose? 100 paraplegias, 100 lives, or both should have the same priority. I'll now launch number three. Give you 10 more seconds. Now here, again, the vast majority of you choose to save 100 lives, but there's a significant minority who says both should have the same priority. And now the final question, for those of you who chose to save 100 lives over 100 paraplegias, so that's the vast majority of you, this question is for you. If the lives program would save 100 lives, how many people would program paraplegias have to cure in order for you to be indifferent between choosing program paraplegias and program lives? And again, to simplify it, we have a range for answers somewhere between 101 and 50 million. There's no number large enough 
lives should always have priority. That's our final call. I'll give it another 10 seconds for anyone who still wants to vote. And I'll share the results. And here, the vast majority of you think that there is some number of paraplegias that would outweigh saving 100 lives. But there's still a significant minority who says there's no number large enough. Good. So uh, now, the answers you just gave, which map onto uh, part of the questionnaire that we did, can be mapped into this table. And bear with me, there's some, it's a bit complex, but fundamentally you'll, you'll come to understand it well enough. So on the left-hand side, we see nails versus lines, and they're the possible answers that you could give. If you move from the first uh, block, nails versus lives, one to the right, you see some people might have said, let's save lives when it's an equal number, 100 lives versus 100 nils. That was the vast majority of you. Um, you could also have said equal priority for equal numbers or nails for equal numbers. And one person gave that answer in this group. No one gave the equal priority answer. And then among those who favored lives over uh, nails, you could answer there is some number of nails uh, such that it outweighs saving 100 lives, um, or we should always save lives. And that was the vast majority of you. Then the same happens at the top. In paraplegias versus lives, you could have chosen to prioritize 100 cases of paraplegia over 100 lives. So that's paraplegia for equal numbers. You could have given equal priority for equal numbers. And you could have, as the vast majority of you did, choose lives for equal numbers. And then, Again, the follow-up question, some number of paraplegias over 100 lives in this population of up to 50 million are always save lives. So you see how all the possible answers map here. Now, let me explain what these colors mean. Where is utilitarianism? Uh, that's there, where Jeremy Bentham's picture is. There's some number of nails that would outweigh uh, saving 100 lives. And... Um, also, of course, some number of cases of paraplegia. But also, interestingly, at least if we think that the answer is really no, if the, the alternative answer is no number, not even bigger than 50 million, uh, no natural number, then prioritarianism, there's Matt Adler, well known to this group. Um, there is some number of minor harms which outweigh uh, death. And Mark Flaube has shown in work with Bertolt Tungodden and Peter Valentine, that all plausible versions of e pluralist egalitarianism, namely the view that, roughly speaking, reducing inequality matters, but also total well-being matters, um, will get you the same result. The only difference between utilitarianism on the one hand and prioritarianism and egalitarianism on the other is that there's a different point at which you would switch. There, the answer that would be consistently say always save lives would be an application of Rawls as maximin. Now, Rawls didn't apply maximin to healthcare cases. Indeed, in the theory of justice, he assumes that everyone is healthy and he thinks healthcare leads to special questions. But it's basically uh, an application of maximin would get you always save 100 lives over these others. And here we have an unorthodox uh, character. Um, dressed to impress at my daughter's pirate party. Uh, the parrot is slightly out of focus, but many of you will know that uh, in some of my work and uh, Campbell Brown is another fearsome uh, character uh, out of the standard mold, um, who has argued that uh, indeed it's perfectly coherent to hold a view that some number of uh, severe uh, or moderate impairments can outweigh a life, 
but no number of very minor impairments should be uh, balanced against the lap. So that would put you over there. The view I, I've called it was aggregate relevant claims, but others have called it simply limited aggregation, or uh, Campbell calls it the close enough view. Um, Campbell, I see you have your hand up. But do you want to have a brief question? Yeah, it's just a quick clarificatory question. Mm -hmm. So what you said about utilitarianism and prioritarianism, I was thinking that that's perhaps not strictly true if you're restricting the population size to 50 million. That's correct. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so in principle, the ideally the question would have been uh, no upper bound um, other than, so to speak, it has to be a natural number. But we thought that for people's ability to grasp what's going on, it would be good to mention a definite population, but you're correct. Yep. Uh, but then you'll see there are lots of other areas here. Um, here, we thought uh, this might be rationalizable by a philosophical view, which, which argues as follows, um, the, the, the light orange bit, that you think paraplegia is roughly on a par with death, uh, but nails are not on a par with death, and that the number of nails can eventually outweigh a number, a large enough number of nails can eventually outweigh uh, a death. Um, and if you're in the light green one, you also think paraplegia is on a par with death. That's why you give equal priority for equal numbers of paraplegias and deaths, but uh, that the number of nails doesn't count. So they're, so to speak, close cousins of the. Uh, views in the uh, orange and green boxes. But then the rest, um, I would find hard to understand, although uh, Veronica will later explain that there are some ways of understanding what people said. So we have here Homer Simpson. If you give nails for equal numbers, uh, I'm assuming that the one person in our audience, I don't want to insult anyone, might have misread it or thought that this was a, uh, a typo on our part that we were asking you about 100 nils versus 100 lives. Um, similarly, equal priority for equal numbers seems uh, a bit peculiar when you're dealing with uh, 100 nils versus 100 lives. Here, um, paraplegia for equal numbers um, seem to us also uh, peculiar if you think that paraplegia is worse sorry, is less bad than death. So that's why um, that remains yellow to match Homer Simpson. Uh, and finally, this is, uh, would be extremely peculiar that you think no number of paraplegias cannot weigh 100 lives, but there is some number of nail cases that cannot weigh. So that's the map of uh, possible answers. And you can now locate yourself if you're so inclined, your answers in this, in this map. Now, uh, what about in practice? Well, uh, Britain employs cost effectiveness, which is basically a form of a close cousin of utilitarianism applied in health. Um, and so there, there is some number of small burdens which, can, which cannot weigh the saving of a life. Uh, the World Health Organization um, at least one part of that organization, the uh, choosing, um, it's called WHO choice, basically it's called choosing interventions that are cost effective. Again, uses a simple cost per quality or cost per unit of well-being uh, rule in, rec in, in advising countries which um, interventions to finance in a public health system. And Norway, which, uh, is a closer to pluralist egalitarian or prioritarian view, uh, holds the following three, two, one rule, a person facing a very severe ailment or life-threatening one, um, their uh, increments in their well-being count for three. An increment in well-being for a middling um, burden like paraplegia counts for two. And an increment in well-being generated by uh, say a minor ailment like a nails disease counts from one. So it would be, that's the point we made before, there's a different point at which 
nails would outweigh lives. It's a three times higher than under ordinary utilitarian perspective, but there's still a point um, uh, at which they would outweigh it. So that is standard standard um, policy making. There is one exception in the world, and that is the Netherlands. The Netherlands uses a threshold. It uses standard Norway style equity weighted cost effectiveness, but it has a cutoff. It says small burdens, and indeed the nails example comes from a policy document of theirs, uh, where they say this should not be weighed against the life. Um, and uh, the threshold is designed so that say uh, nails ailments fall below it. They say there we simply we don't do any cost effectiveness analysis at all. We simply do not include anything uh, minor uh, again uh, in the health insurance package because it ought not to be weighed against more serious ailments. <clears throat> and no other uh, view systematically ends up anywhere else as far as I know. Good, so I'll, I'll now hand over to Veronica. So the tables that we just presented capture different patterns, how people can respond to priority setting dilemmas. And a method that is often used to elicit these preferences is called person trade-off method, because this is what it does. It asks people to choose between treatment programs for two distinct groups of people. So in essence, it asks for their moral preferences over interpersonal trade-offs. And in that respect, it is uh, different to traditional elicitation methods that uh, focus on prudential or self-interested preferences like time trade-off or standard gamble. And so PTO incorporates societal or social preferences into these elicitations. So in essence, it requires decision makers because these um, people often face health conditions that differ in their severity. So it requires them to make a trade-off to balance between providing a large health benefit for few people and a smaller health benefit for, for many. However, one of the complications that researchers face when they use this PTO method is that people often seem to refuse to make such trade-offs. Uh, so there are two different types of refusals that they give described in the literature. One of them is called equivalence refusals and the, others, uh, the other is off-scale refusals. So I'll first talk about the former type. That's the situation that was quite rare in this uh, group of prevalently philosophers. And it uh, corresponds to a situation when someone says that a program curing 100 people of mild shortness of breath should have the same priority as a program curing 100 people of severe shortness of breath. So we have two programs, the same size of um, groups that can be helped. There is a clear difference in uh, severity. And despite that, respondent indicates that they should have equal priority or that they are indifferent between these two. And... Uh, these kind of responses are problematic because uh, they lead in problems in interpretation. It is simply not clear how they should be analyzed, whether they should be taken in their, at their face value as considered moral judgments that simply represent stronger preference for equality or equal access to treatment, whatever the need might be, or whether they are protest responses. They're simply refusals to make trade-offs, maybe because people are outraged. Um, and in terms of their prevalence, uh, the empirical research shows that they are relatively frequent, although the estimates vary from the studies that we explored and analyzed, there was between 0% and over 40%. But quite a few of these studies were using small convenient samples of undergraduate students or such. So it is not quite clear where, uh, where the true estimate uh, lies. In any case, we excluded studies that uh, didn't allow us to isolate equivalence refusals from mere equivalence responses. So for instance, if there was a study that asked respondents to indicate a severity of a disease on a scale between zero and one, zero being utility of being dead and one being utility in living in perfect health, and you would have a condition, let's say very strong knee problems that unknown makes you unable to walk and it's very painful and you would say it's a utility of 0 0.5 and there was uh, another disease that has utility of zero like an acute appendicitis 
And then they would not ask you to compare 10 cases of uh, the acute disease that is fatal if not treated and 10 cases of the knee condition, but they would adjust the numbers based on the severity indicated. So they would ask you to compare 20 versus 10. So in such cases, as we can see maybe on the next slide, um, Alex, uh, there is a difference between, between equivalent refusal when the difference in severity is clearly there, like uh, nails versus lives, but it's not always the case when the severity of diseases is similar. Like for example, for some people, paraplegia can be close to you know, being dead because they imagine that it's a very serious condition, not worth living. Yeah, so this would be just uh, equivalence response or it wouldn't be uh, clear. I'll try. Then we also looked at the uh, uh, next slide. Uh, then we also looked at factors that can be driving these equivalence refusals. So one of the study, one of the studies explored uh, whether different perspectives can influence how people, how likely people are to give equivalence refusals. So they would ask people to make trade-offs between mild versus moderate versus severe shortness of breath and similar for physical paralysis. So it was really clear that the severity is different of the conditions. But in one case, they asked them uh, to imagine that they are a health system director and they need to choose between two programs. One is curing people from mild shortness of breath. The other is curing them from severe shortness of breath. They can only choose one. The same number of people will be helped. So similar to what you went through. And uh, they ask them which, uh, um, which program they would choose, thereby leaving the other group untreated. And that was the rationing frame. And then the other frame was so-called benefits frame. So simply they told them that one group of people was cured of mild shortness of breath. The other was cured of severe shortness of breath. Uh, the same number of people were cured in each group. And which group received the overall greatest benefit? And contrary to their predictions, they found out that the benefits frame actually led to a higher number of equivalence refusals, that people simply indicated that they received the, the, same, the same benefit. And then they explore what can be behind that. So they look at the, the level of outrage that people felt. And the higher was the level of outrage, the higher was the likelihood of giving equivalence refusals, which would indicate that these indeed are protest responses. But the higher was the level of perceived difficulty, the lower were the equivalence refusals. So maybe if people really take time and effort to think about it also, although these are hard trade-offs, then uh, they are less likely to give such uh, refusals. And also they found out that there is a relationship between the difference in severity, and which makes sense that the greater is the difference in severity, the less likely people are to give equivalence refusals. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, the other type of refusals that we were interested in in looking at the literature is what's known as off-scale refusals. It's when you say no number of a given condition can outweigh some number of another condition. So, for example, there's no number of cured nails that I would prioritize over saving 100 lives. Um, so here's a more strict definition. When asked a person trade-off question of the kind, you can save 100 lives or n people from a less severe ailment, for which end are you indifferent or do you believe either one is permissible? And respondents say there is no number large enough. So in our uh, block, you'd have uniform off-scale refusals would be in the maximum inbox, you always prioritize lives over any number of cases of paraplegia <clears throat> and always prioritize them over any number of nails. Uh, Peter, I've seen your hand. I'll just complete this bit and uh, uh, then you ask your question. Then here we have off-scale refusal for a large gap in severity only. Um, so you don't give an off-scale refusal for paraplegia, but you do give it for nails against lives. And a subset of those cases is the theory that I've uh, defended and that Campbell and others that we know, uh, Bastian Stoyer and uh, a former student, Corbinian Ruger, have also uh, defend it. Uh, yeah, Peter. Peter, I saw your hand up. Peter Zuzu. No? Okay, we'll move on. Um, on this side, you'd have an off-skill refusal uh, for... Uh, sorry, can, um, can you hear me now? Yes, I can, yeah. I think you okay. I pressed the wrong button from muting. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, 
instead of asking about 100, suppose you asked about one, then logically, if it's off scale, it should be the same answer. Would you in practice get the same answer if you said one treatment versus any number? So I'm not sure, as we'll indicate in a moment, the literature on this is extremely small. And in fact, we think this is, our study is the first one to do it properly. Okay. That's indeed something we, we should study. There's, there's a reason in general, I mean, uh, Veronica knows more of this literature than I do, but there's a reason in general that in the person trade-off method, which is what we've been using, um, you don't go one versus N. The reason is that one has in, the psych in psychology a special significance. It actually makes it easier to identify with the person. And there are some studies, I think by Kogut and Ritov, which suggest that you take on a different frame when it's one person versus a group, okay. as opposed to when it's a group versus a group. Yeah. Um, but it, it is definitely worth studying. But that, I think, is the reason why normally person trade-off cases are done with 10 or 100. Okay, thanks. Is that right, Veronica? Yeah, yeah. Um, so here, the, the light yellow, yellow is signal, you know, think of Homer Simpson's yellow tone, uh, always looks a bit dodgy, uh, whereas green and blue signify, you know, intelligence, like the green shirt of uh, Campbell Brown's icon here. Um, so the literature on this has many imperfections. I surveyed it in an article in behavioral public policy, if you're interested, in 2018. I'll just give you two examples. Um, Ubel and others in 1996 did a study, uh, of, a convenience study of just 42 students. And uh, they had a, uh, sorry, it should, be, it should be cysts versus lives, a small cyst on your hand, which can come from too much typing, you know, basically a sac around one of your tendons that fills with uh, fluid and can be slightly painful, but has no further bad effects. So that's minor, that's like the nails case. Uh, versus uh, uh, disease uh, trading off against lives. And the other one, a meningioma is a growth in the lining of your brain, um, which isn't fatal, but which causes uh, uh, periodically debilitating headaches, which are extremely difficult to, uh, the pain is extremely difficult to suppress. So that's, you know, uh, quite severe. And uh, you can see that basically the pattern but they found it's, they were not after the thing that we're after. So if I assume this yellow box is zero, then I can derive from the numbers the following, that the vast majority, 60%, were actually in the utilitarian slash prioritarian box, um, where numbers always count, even for large differences in severity. Very few were in the maxim in box, that's the blue one, only 5%, uh, but still a significant share were in uh, about around a third were in the aggregate relevant claims or limited aggregation box. So meningiomas count against lives, but uh, cysts don't count against lives, small cysts. Now, the problem was they asked it in a benefit frame. They asked the question in the way that uh, Veronica previously identified in the Dan Schroeder study. They said, they didn't say, what should we do? Whom, which group should be prioritized? They asked, which, for which number of cysts would the benefit received by the people cured of the cyst be equal to saving 10 people of death? But of course, it's perfectly coherent to say there is some number at which the aggregate benefits are equal, but nonetheless, we ought always, for non-consequentialist reasons, to save the people who are facing death. So that's why the benefit frame, I think, underestimates uh, the number in the green box there and pushes you too much towards the orange box. <clears throat> Damshoder's study previously mentioned already corrects some of this. It's much larger. It's representative of the U.S. population, chosen to be representative of the U.S. population. They did a choice frame, which is good. Um, but their problem is that the differences, ideally you want large differences, but, uh, especially between the minor and the severe impairment. But there, they did not use death, they used uh, quadriplegia and they used foot paralysis. They call it foot numbness, but when you read the instruction, it's basically no feeling at all in your feet, uh, in one of your feet. <clears throat> um, 
And uh, the other one was paraplegia. So uh, what we see here is uh, an even stronger pattern towards the standard utilitarian or prioritarian response. Again, we have to extract these numbers. This is not what they were after. We have to extract it if we assume zero in the yellow box. Uh, very, relatively few people answered in the maximin box and one in five in the um, aggregate relevant claims box. But we think this might be an underestimate for a different reason than in the UBL study. Because, though the choice frame was correct, the differences might not be large enough. So um, our study, that's two. Is that right, Veronica? Yeah. So then we designed the study. Uh, it was pretty much online survey to address some of the shortcomings that we identified in the existing research. In particular, we used a larger representative sample. This was representative of the UK population. We let people compare conditions of different kinds. So when you recall the Dan Schroeder study compared conditions that were of the same kind with a progressive severity, which is not ideal representation of the actual trade-offs the policymakers need to make. They are comparing conditions of different severity. And other studies show that if you ask people to do that, then uh, equivalence refusals are much, uh, much lower. So we wanted to test that. But the problem with comparing different conditions are that the severity might not be clear. You might assume certain pattern of severity, but people might understand it differently. And that's why we included severity ranking to be sure that people correctly interpreted it. Then we use the choice frame. Um, we use the advisor um, framing. So it was not the actual decision maker, but the person was asked what program should the director choose. And then we allow them to compare conditions with a rather small as well as large difference in severity. So it was between the nails disease that uh, uh, you had in the beginning of the talk and um, a fatal disorder. And then we also included a robustness check. So it was an embedded experiment to test whether people might be influenced in their preferences by the current status, what is currently covered by the healthcare system. So whether there is some indication of status quo bias that was well identified in non-moral decision making. Next slide. So here we can see how we did the severity ranking. People were presented with the descriptions of these three conditions, and then they were asked, how is it for a person to live with the following health condition? And unless they indicated that it is worse to live with a fatal disorder than with a paraplegia, and that it is worse to live with a paraplegia than with the nails disease, they were excluded from the study. It was about 12% of respondents. And then we also checked uh, how big of a difference they perceived it to be. So the average difference between nails disease and fatal autoimmune disorder was about 80 out of 100. And the average difference between Nails disease uh, between, sorry, paraplegia and fatal disorder was about uh, 20. It was not so much. And as for our findings, so first, what we found is that uh, nearly half of the respondents do not um, adhere to any philosophical theory or their responses don't have philosophical rationale or the one we could uh, identify which is different to this group. Um, but uh, we cannot say that uh, no philosophical rational means that the responses were completely unreasonable or irrational, as you can see from some illustrative quotes. So for example, this person indicated that one should always save lives when the alternative is saving nails, but they indicated that it is uh, that the saving 100 people from paraplegia should have a priority over saving people with the fatal disorder. And their rationale was that uh, when uh, people who, um, who have uh, this fatal disorder die, they will not suffer much longer. Well, if you keep people um, living with paraplegia longer, then the overall suffering would be prolonged. So that's one type of responses that we find quite reasonable. But then there were other types of responses, such as uh, it's important to cure everyone so because everyone deserves a chance to be cured from an illness or disease, so I think that's the most ethical thing to do, uh, to share it. Or uh, other person indicated uh, that the point is to eradicate 
all diseases despite some being easier to combat than others. So there's with doing empirical research to test people's preferences over ethical dilemmas, it is important to bear in mind that people have um, all sorts of reasons for, uh, for their views, which are not easy to grasp on the first sight. Our second finding was related to equivalence refusals. Uh, and uh, consistent with the uh, previous research, we found that uh, they are much more likely. Uh, people are much more likely to give equivalence refusals when the difference in severity is, um, is smaller yeah, when, than it, when it is large. So you can see that there were more people, and actually that was what, what has driven majority of these non-philosophical uh, responses is that people indicated equal priority for curing people of paraplegia than saving lives. Well, when they should comp uh, when they were comparing nails and lives, there were relatively few people who indicated equal priority. And next finding was related to off-scale refusals for which the pattern is reversed. They are much more likely when the gap in severity is large than when it is modest. Again, it makes sense and it's consistent with the previous findings. We also tested the impact of status quo. We did it, we tested it experimentally. So we randomly allocated uh, people into three groups. One was a control. We told them that under the current healthcare system, none of the conditions that they were considering is covered. Then there was a treatment one, which we can call a nudge towards utilitarian calculus. So we told them that what is currently covered are these um, diseases that are less severe, but they are affecting larger number of people, so nail disease or paraplegia. And in the treatment two, which we can call nudge towards maximin, we told them that currently what is covered is the treatment for fatal disorder because it's uh, really serious that people can die if uh, they, are not, uh, they are not treated. Um, however, we didn't find any treatment effect. So maybe on the first side, as you can see on the left, uh, when we included all respondents, uh, there seems to be some effect of treatment too, of the nudge towards uh, maximin. However, when we excluded all those who did not pass um, comprehension attention checks, so we weren't sure whether they really understood what the status quo was, whether they read it properly, uh, then there was no treatment effect. Which is somewhat good news that people are not biased towards status quo when they are making such important decisions. Good. So, um... Now switching to the, uh, not the yellow, but the more, uh, the other colored blocks, one remarkable finding, especially in contrast with the other studies, the UBO study and the Damschroder study, which had an overwhelming majority of people in the orange box, so the, the utilitarian uh, or prioritarian box, um, very few of our respondents were there, only 10%. And uh, the very, the light colored orange neighbor um, is, people who were who judged paraplegia to be quite close in severity in our severity test with death. So 10 points difference on a 100 point scale or less. So if you want, you can include them, but still it's only 12% of the full uh, population, even though the overwhelming uh, majority of policy uh, is in that block. And so there's definitely a mismatch there. One lesson to take away is a mismatch between uh, at least the answers that people report in our study and um, actual uh, policy in a uh, healthcare priority setting. And maximum answers are also relatively rare, although somewhat more frequent than uh, utilitarian or prioritarian ones. Um, more frequent than in the Dam, Schroeder and Ubel study, uh, as we, in a sense, predicted because we thought they would lead to an underestimation of this type of response. But of course, what I find especially interesting um, is that the most common response is something that fits aggregate relevant claims, which is a non-standard distributive uh, theory of distributive justice. And if we take away half the population who gave quote unquote unreasonable answers, answers that we can't justify with an appeal to any of the standard philosophical theories in our framework, then it's 44%. So it's twice as likely, twice as frequent as um, the uh, 
uh, utilitarian and prioritarian answers and also twice as frequent as maximin. And indeed, if we then, the, the light green boxes, those people who roughly said priority is on a par, uh, sorry, paraplegia is on a par with death in terms of its severity um, and therefore giving them equal priority, but uh, always prioritize uh, lives over um, nails, then we'd even arrive at uh, higher numbers. So there seems to be, uh, that's not yet support for the theory per se, but insofar as we're engaged in reflective equilibrium, but also insofar as, for example, uh, policymakers are interested in tracking the um, preferences of their populations. This is, of course, it's just one study, but it's suggestive that the Dutch um, approach is somewhat closer to at least the first blush answer of people to these questions than the Norwegian or the British or the WHO approach. Again, that's not to say that it's an argument for the view per se, but it does um, show that it at least has some legs among the general population. And there's no previous study indicated this because no study um, looked in the right framing at this question. So let's take a step back. What are our overall conclusions? The first is that an overwhelming majority of respondents hold views that depart from standard priority setting principles. So standard priority setting principles is 10% of our respondents fit it, or if you're generous, 12%. If you want to include maximin, which no one actually uses for priority setting, but philosophers like it, then it's a quarter uh, of uh, answers. Um, and this is, an issue, I mean, we might, we should debate, I'm really interested in your views, uh, what we should, what conclusion we should draw from this, but it's, from a policy perspective, it's definitely uh, an issue because, for example, the Dutch um, document, which uh, justifies its policy, which departs from standard priority setting, says, we believe, although they had no evidence whatsoever, since there was no study of this kind, we believe that this better tracks the judgments of the Dutch population about how to trade off minor against more severe impairments. <clears throat> and they believe that there's a democratic obligation to track people's reasonable judgments. Um, around half of respondents don't even do the most minimal thing that every theory of distributive justice, including the non-standard one that I proposed, uh, but holds, which is that you should prioritize by severity, that when you have the same number of individuals in two different groups and one group faces a more severe ailment, you should treat, prioritize those facing the more severe ailment. Half of the respondents don't even do that. Uh, and among the remaining respondents, though limited aggregation is much more popular than full aggregation. So again, the standard move in distributive theories that the numbers always count is I think at least uh, the people in our study don't share that, appear not to share that judgment. And interestingly, as Veronica articulated, uh, there's much debate about status quo bias um, and indeed whether it is a bias. Uh, it didn't appear to our surprise actually to impact people's preferences here. Now in relation to suggestions for further research, of course, we're also happy to discuss other topics with you. One thing which we didn't do is provide space for discussion and deliberation. And um, there is evidence that uh, in person trade-off questionnaires of the type that we've just done, that uh, people change their answers after deliberation. Um, and uh, the second point is that uh, it would be good to include uh, an assessment of conditions uh, balancing them against death in the severity ranking. Uh, the way we phrase the question is how hard is it to live with the condition that the fatal autoimmune disorder gave you three months to live. Uh, we might have had a different way of phrasing that to really bring out the balancing against death issue. Um, another interesting question is whether people are sensitive to the relative differences in severity. So nails versus lives, there's a very large gap 
or whether they just think there's some cutoff point below which it doesn't really matter, a kind of sufficiency threshold. Um, and finally, there's this question, which I've mentioned a number of times, how, if at all, should policymakers incorporate these non-standard views into policymaking? Um, do we think, for example, that our findings offer some indirect support for the Dutch policy reform? Okay, thanks very much.